the tribulation period, the end times, this will be our conclusion of the end times Bible study. And then at the end of tonight, we will have pizza night and fellowship. So I was wanting to end a little bit early to get you some pizza. Now, I always stay up here at the uh, end of the service, and I will pray with you, answer questions, whatever we need to do at that time. Does that make sense to everybody? But I need to go. We've got an international audience watching as well, and I wanted to get on with the word here tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for putting me on as your microphone. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are anointing us to hear the word of God, anointing us to be taught in the things of God, anointing us, O oh God, Lord, that we would have ears to hear, and Lord, give me the tongue to preach with utterance of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, did you enjoy Sunday night with John and Rachel? Wasn't that amazing? I tell you what, I mean, I was refreshed and ready to go. Last week, we did eternal time periods, seven dispensations, seven administrations of how the Bible was laid out. We're in the age of grace with the church age. We're getting ready to go. Now, you and I will go into the, hopefully, if, we, if the Jesus raptures us, we will go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, but the next age would be after this one is the tribulation period. You don't want to be here for the tribulation. Now, I've had people say, well, pastor, I believe that we're going to be here during the tribulation. Okay, and guess what? You might be right. There, there is some scriptural evidence to support that in the Bible. I believe there's more to support that we won't be here. But I, you know, some people say, are you post-trib, pre-trib, or mid-trib? I say, I'm pan-trib. It's all going to pan out. If you've got the Holy Ghost, if you know Jesus, if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. We may have a difficult time. It might not be easy. But guess what? We may have difficult times now. It might not be easy right here, right now. Amen. We're going to have to go through some difficult times here on this earth. In this life, you will have troubles. But in the tribulation, your troubles are going to get on steroids. Okay? You're going to, it's going to be the trouble of all troubles. And we're going to study that tonight a little bit. But then we go from the tribulation to the millennium to eternity and we had, I, I know some people asked some really good questions about those. Uh, and uh, I was answer, answering a lot of questions last week, and they were great questions. And one of the greatest questions that came up, um, someone said, hey, pastor, you know, and he, he had my heart. He said, I, I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to miss this. How do you really, really know? I thought that was a great answer, a great question. And, and, and the answer is, we have to believe what the Word of God says. And we have to believe that when we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. Amen. Now, I do believe as we read Scripture, we see that when we call on the name of the Lord, it's going to cause us to grow. It's going to cause us to not to be legalistic, not, not, to, not to do keep the law, but it is going to cause us to be holy. It is going to cause us to want to do things for Christ in a, in a Christ-like way, to live our lives in a Christ-like manner. And so, but when you ask Jesus into your heart and you sincerely repent of your sins, you sincerely give yourself to him, what, you know, when we call on the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. Amen. And I've led people to, to the Jesus, and so have some of you, on their very last death, the moments of their deathbed. And I have to believe, just like that thief on the cross, that Man, when they call on Jesus, they, they, they are going to experience eternal reward. Amen. And so that's how we know. And uh, worst case scenario, I said, what if, I, what if you're wrong, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you, if I'm wrong, I still believe the Christian life is the best life to live on this earth. And I still really do. So today, I'm going to give you a nutshell version of the tribulation period. Now, I recognize, and I, I, I honest to goodness mean this, now, I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not good at. Uh, I am not the best end time teacher out there, okay? I, I, I don't have any problem admitting that because as a pastor, I'm here to deal with the nasty here and now, okay? I'm here to get you to the sweet by and by, but we got to get you through the nasty here and now, okay? And so that's just my my calling. Now, that doesn't mean I'm dumb. It doesn't mean I don't know what I'm talking about. But like if you take a guy like Hilton Sutton, 
I mean, that guy was just, that's what he devoted his entire life and ministry to. I mean, he had almost the whole book of Revelation memorized, and it was just, he was a brilliant man, okay? He's no longer on earth. Uh, there are some other guys that are really good at it. Um, Tim LaHaye, uh, he, he put a great book together on the, on the, on the Revelation. Um, he was part of that, uh, um, he did the uh, series, uh, what, who said it, yelled out? Left Behind, thank you. He wrote the book Left Behind. They did a movie on it uh, many years ago, and uh, he's a good one. His studies are pretty accurate. Uh, those two, it's going to be hard. I've heard a lot of people say, well, Jack Van Impey this, Jack Van Impey. I'm not against Jack Van Impey. Uh, you know, he's got some good stuff out there. I, I can't remember if he's still living or not. Uh, he is, okay. I think it's his wife maybe who passed away. But, uh, uh, but he's got some good stuff out there, okay? So, that's just not my major thrust, but at the same time, we can study the Bible. We're going to start tonight at the point of the rapture of the church, and Revelation 4 and 1 uh, and is where we're going to pick it up. Revelation 4 and 1, and this angel is going to speak to John. Now, John, they tried to kill him on multiple occasions. This is John the disciple, the one who the Bible says that leaned on the breast of Jesus, the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. And it says, chapter 4, verse 1, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and that the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. And so the angel said, hey, I want to show you how this is going to work. Now, as we read the book of Revelation, it's, it's one of the things I want you to, you got to put yourself in this framework. None of this stuff was invented yet. This was a primitive culture still. This was walk down to the community shared well, draw your water, and walk back. Okay? This was no electricity, no plumbing, uh, no air conditioning, I mean, no cars. Why would anybody want to live back then? I mean, why didn't they choose to be born now? I tell you, we got it much better. But here they were. And so they're trying to describe things that have not been invented yet. And so they're using the best terminology they have to try to describe it, okay? And so we have to keep that in mind. So... The rapture is going to happen. And before we go any further, that seven-year tribulation period, I want us to understand the heart of God. If you get anything tonight, I want you to understand why we have a seven-year tribulation period. This is not God having a temper tantrum against the earth. Okay? You know, this is that... God's heartbeat is for the lost. You know, even, you know, as, as she brought out, Jesus wept. You know, at, I think that was a great revelation. Jesus wept not because he was sad about Lazarus being, he, he knew he could bring Lazarus back, okay? If Jesus was that bent out of shape over it, he would have just went the first day and kept him from dying. That's a good revelation right there. So, he cried because he had to bring him back from heaven. All right, man, they're gonna, they're gonna, this, this is going to hurt him more, more than it's going to hurt us, uh, more than it's going to help us. So <laughs> we have the book of Revelation. We have this seven-year tribulation period because in God's mercy, he's giving one more chance for people to get born again. He is showing people a little glimpse of what hell is like and saying, you don't want this. Please get born again, okay? So when I hear, and, 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 and it took me a long time to figure that out. Man, when I, first, when I was a kid reading the book of Revelation, man, I, I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, God, that sounds like God's mean, God's mad, God's just killing people, God's doing all this bad stuff. And I, I thought, man, that's just, that's just a mean God. 
But once I realized that the book of Revelation is a book of love, that it is God who has sent his only begotten son, who they killed and hung on a cross, and he cried, forgive them for they know not what they do. For this God who gave us Jesus, who then over the ages we've, we've sinned, we, we've, we've, we've done terrible things, we've even after getting born again, you know, we sang that song tonight, the grace of Jesus always reaches me. I mean, but we need the grace of Jesus to always reach us because our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so when I recognize the grace of God, the love of God behind the book of Revelation, behind the tribulation, it helped me a lot to understand the rest of the book. So I hope that if you see anything tonight, those seven years are not just God being mean. Those are God's last warnings to be saved before you have to perish for all of eternity. Okay? So chapter 5 and 6, the seven sealed scroll. And the best I can describe this as is just an old-time scroll. And a seal um, would have been, in that day and age, a seal was simply a, a wax, um, melted wax that they would put. They would roll the scroll up. And you know kind of how we use scotch tape to, to attach paper? They would drop hot wax on it, and then you would have a seal. Um, and like people in that day and age would have a seal, that the family ring would have a seal on it, and they would press that seal, the ring, into that wax, and it would form uh, an emblem of that family seal, that family name, and that was basically like, likened unto their family signature, okay? And so <laughs> we're going to see the seven-sealed scroll, um, Chapter 5, verse 1, and I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll when loose its seals, and no one in heaven or on the earth <clears throat> or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And, buddy, that's an awesome teaching right there, the seven spirits of God. Man, if you ever want to have fun, just study those seven spirits. My goodness. And... Um, Anyways, uh, uh, seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he, verse 8, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. My goodness gracious, don't ever think that God does not hear your prayer. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's just whole containers. You know, it says bowls. When I think of a bowl, I think of a cereal bowl. Yeah, you know, I think, of, you know, that's what you put your Frosted Flakes or your Cheerios in. I just have a feeling that that, that bowl means something. That's more like 55-gallon drums, you know, or great big vats. Vats, you know, thousands of gallons of container. That the prayers are the same. At least I hope it is. I hope our prayers are not the, making the equivalent of a bowl of Rice Krispies. I mean, a little snap, crackle, pop. I hope our prayers are, are filling entire, you know, shipping containers, praise God. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and verse 9, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed to us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign in all the earth. And 
You know, it's one of those things. I, I don't ever, I don't like to ever pick a fight, but you know, there are just so many people that that they're so they got this religious spirit, and it's like, well, we can only sing the hymns. We can't sing any of the new stuff. Listen, if you're if you're going to be stuck on the old stuff, then you've got. If you say we're only singing the old stuff, if you're not singing out of the Psalms, if you're not singing the Book of Psalms or what songs like this, then I'm sorry, but your hymns are dated. Okay, your hymns are dated, and some of them came in in the 1500s, some came in the 1800s. Uh, so you're not the only generation that's ever had the opportunity to praise God. And here, there's these elders are singing a new song. I mean, they're singing new songs in heaven. They're making new stuff up. I, I, I mean, that's pretty cool. They, I mean, I, I, I can imagine that when we get to heaven, the music department's going to be pretty good. Amen. Amen. I think our church is going to have an opportunity to lead a few times, but uh, I, th- I think there's going to be some pretty good musicians up there. I'll bet you we hear sounds we've never heard before. I'll bet, I'll bet you they have sounds like, I mean, can, I mean, have you ever heard whales calling to each other? Isn't that a beautiful sound? Or have you ever heard, I mean, just the sounds of nature. I mean, man, we're just a few days away from going out and sitting on the porch and listening to crickets and listening to the sounds of the night. Uh, and, and, and I mean, God is a God of sound. You know, and I'll bet you we're just going to hear some amazing music in heaven. So the next few verses talk about how Jesus is worthy. Verse 12, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice. And I like the, you know, you, we, the old saying was, if it's too loud, you're too old. Uh, but I, I will tell you this, heaven is going to have some loud sounds. Amen. Heaven is going to be a place where music is going all the time. And they're not singing quietly. They're going to sing boldly, okay? And when you think, here's what, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands, and they're singing with loud voices, I mean, come on, man. It's going to be a rocking place. I can't, I mean, praise God. You know, I'm, I'm in no hurry to get there. But when I do, don't pray that I raise from the dead. You let me go. Amen. I don't want to be like old Vern and Eunice, you know, getting all upset about them bran muffins, you know. <laughs> so, with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such are as in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be it to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. And then one of the four living creatures said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Buddy, that's a scene. I love love studying the heavenly scenes. I love it. You know, I've studied heaven a lot. And um, I've got to tell you, it's, it's going to, I think we know this, but it's going to blow us away. It's just, it's, it's going to blow us away. We, we think, I mean, we kind of know, we're, we're trying to anticipate, but there's going to be colors in heaven. I mean, there's, we, we can see a fraction of colors that are actually out there because our eyeballs are limited. But there's so many more colors that can be produced than what we can see. But we're going to see different colors. And, and here, there's this, this, this loud, angelic entourage, and they're bowing down. They're worshiping Jesus. And here's the seals. Um, and there's going to be seven seals through chapter 6 uh, that are released. So what's happening is there's a scroll, and they're taking, out the, they're taking out basically a subsequent scroll and saying this is the judgment that's being pronounced as part of the tribulation. And so they're, they're worshiping Jesus. Jesus is the one who's worthy to say, hey, we're going to release this. Jesus was presented here as a lamb that was slain. Okay, he's presented here as the one who took all the sin of the world. Oh, my goodness. So because he took all the sin, because he defeated the devil, he has the authority to release this stuff 
onto the earth. And Jesus, now remember, he died for us. He died for us. He doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to suffer. He earned the right to bring this tribulation into our lives because, not our lives hopefully, but into the lives of people as a final act of love to say, please don't go to hell. Please don't go to hell. Amen. All right. Seal number one, a white horse. There's going to be a rise of a world power with much war and conflict. Now, I've heard people say, well, aren't these, couldn't these be just ages that have been since Jesus uh, left, you know, 2,000 years ago? No. This happens at the seven-year tribulation period. These things are all going to be after the church is raptured, okay? These are going to happen in a seven-year period. The first thing is there's going to be the rise of a world power that is going to bring much war and conflict. And that is a white horse that's going to ride, and that's what he's going to do. The seal number two is a red horse, and he's going to take peace out of the earth and the world is going to be given to violence. Now, I don't know about you, but I can think about some violent places on this earth. I think, you know, I don't know about you, but if I was ever driving in Chicago, I don't want to get lost on the south side. Okay? Uh, there's just certain places you don't want to be on this earth because they're noted for violence. But at the same time, you can walk down Main Street, Cloverdale, and just go like this. And, and everybody around going to go like this. You know, every now and then I rent a tractor. Uh, you know, I have to go pick up a tractor. I'll drive a tractor through town. It's one of my favorite things to do. You know, <laughs> Je Jeff was getting on me yesterday because I had to rent a piece of equipment. I'm driving through town on my piece of equipment. And I'm just Farmer Matt, you know, driving down. And, and Jeff says, you just love doing that and waving at people. I said, you're so right. I just, Farmer Matt driving down, you know, hey, how y'all doing? And, 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 you know, people just wave back, praise God. But as, as bad as the earth is in some places, there is still peace on earth. There is still a, 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 a rational mankind that desires peace. But when you take all the Christians out, okay, we're losing all the preachers, hopefully. All the Christians, hopefully. We are... And then there's this spirit of violence that's released. It's going to make the south side of Chicago look like a day at an amusement park. Okay? Uh, it's going to be given to wickedness. All right? The third seal, the black horse, and, and before I go on, the tribulation period is divided into two halves, like a football game, kind of, okay, two halves. The first half is three and a half years. The second half is three and a half years. The first half is really bad. But the second half is really, 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 really bad. Okay? And we're just starting off, and it's going to get progressively worse. Okay? The black horse is seal number three. Rides out. And in that, as the black horse rides out, food will become scarce, and there will be exponential inflation. How many, I don't know about you, but hasn't it felt weird these last two years? I mean, to see shelves that were empty or not, I mean, there, there's people that need parts for their car, and they, they have people that have had a part, a car in a shop for six months or a year, and they can't get it fixed because they can't get a part for it. You know, I don't know how you feel about inflation, but... I'm telling you, man, it's not fun. You know, inflation affects uh, poor people, and it affects middle-class people more than it does uh, the wealthy. And, and if you had a, you know, two years ago, if a tank of gas cost you $30, it now cost you about $110 for the same tank. Maybe, maybe, maybe $75, $85. But gas has more than doubled in the last 12 months, Okay. 
And then you, you add on to that the price of goods, of, of meat and bread. And, and if you want to buy a car right now, I mean, that's went up 30, 40 percent. Uh, many of you know I have a side business in the asphalt world. Asphalt prices are up 40% this year because they're tied to the oil industry. And uh, just, you cannot get a piece of equipment. I mean, it, it, it's just insane. Uh, what, what, and and we're, we have nothing compared to what's going to happen. Uh, the days after World War II and the days after World War I in Germany, I mean, they, it would take bucket loads of their largest denominations of bills to buy a loaf of bread. Okay, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament, and I, I can't remember where it's at, but it, it's a prophecy about this time, and it talks about how people would give their firstborn for a loaf of bread, that, that bread will become so scarce, okay? And uh, just uh, this hyperinflation. And so we got just a tiny little taste over the last two years, and I mean tiny. Because I guarantee you, most of you had Amazon packages come into your house two or three times a week. Most of you during that time, during the COVID shutdown. But bless God, you better save the cardboard because you can't buy toilet paper. So <laughs> anyway, get you some old shirts or whatnot. But uh, that was a rough time. I mean, going to the store and not being able to buy toilet paper, not being able to buy peanut butter, not being able to buy those things, that was just weird. But that's going to cover the whole face of the earth. And have you, I mean, can you imagine the dark side of people when there's a shortage like that and there's a spirit of violence that's already been loosed? A spirit of violence has been loosed and now there's a shortage. What are people going to do for that bread? What are people going to do for that food? They're going to kill each other for it. I mean, it's going to be a horrible time. And then a pale horse is going to release a spirit of death that 25% of the world's population is going to be killed. Now, once again, I, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I really feel like the last two years of COVID were like just a little mini wake-up call, hey, you don't want to be around for the tribulation. Because we, we had just a small fraction as terrible as COVID was, we did not lose 25% of the world's population. Amen? I mean, we, there was a small fraction, uh, but yet it shut the whole world down, just a small fraction. Now there's no food. There's hyperinflation. There's a spirit of violence. And now 25% of the world dies can you imagine trying to be alive during that time? Wow. Okay. Uh, seal number five. The cry of the martyrs. Let's go down to verse nine, chapter six. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. And so what's happening with the, sixth, or the fifth seal is the cry of the martyrs is beginning to take its full Weight on the throne of heaven. Okay, all of a sudden, the the the, the basically the, the the cry of of those people that have been slain is being filling the throne room, filling the spiritual realms, and those cries are going to testify against every wicked person, and so it's kind of like. You know, if you've heard what a war cry is, so to speak, can you imagine, you know, if you're getting ready, if you can think if you've ever watched a war movie and the battle is intense and they fix their bayonets and as they get ready to charge, they, they give out a, you know, a yell as they're charging. 
Can you imagine? This is like the war cry of what's about to happen, that heaven's getting ready. To, they're, they're, they're gearing themselves up, and they're hearing the cry of the martyrs as their rallying call. Okay? Uh, number six, cosmic chaos. Uh, great disturbances of the atmosphere. Earthquakes. Meteor showers, the sun quits giving light, the moon becomes blood. And uh, if you read on, uh, let's look at verse 13. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when shaken by a mighty wind. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For who can stand against this wrath? Okay. Now, then... Uh, it's going to change a little bit. Uh, verse chapter 7, we're going to see uh, 144,000 come marching forth. And what's going to happen is the Lord is going to somehow, and I don't know how, but minister to Jewish people. And there are going to be a mass amount of Jewish people that get born again during this time. And then the Lord is going to send them forth preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there will be 144,000 preachers going out. And if you just went through that for a couple years, three years, you're going to be motivated to preach. Amen. Amen. And then the seventh seal, found in Revelation 8. Uh, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And, uh, you know, in preaching, they teach us how to, there, there's, a, there's an art to preaching, okay? Uh, and I can do things to get your attention. Tonight I'm teaching, but just in the way I move my voice, just in the way I we call it pause, pitch, punch. The way I enunciate my words, different things, I can get people to really buy into a message just simply by how I direct my voice, you see. And then when I pause, it draws you in. And there's going to be silence in heaven for a half an hour. My goodness gracious. Silence in heaven. Now, you see, we study how loud heaven is. And we, st I mean, every, t as a matter of fact, every time you read in the Bible about heaven, it's loud. Except for one spot right there. And this is uh, where God is saying it's about to get real. Okay, as bad as it's been, it's about to get a whole lot worse because we just listened to those cries of the martyrs. And we're going to wrap this thing up soon, and we need to do everything within our power to not let people go to hell. And so in Revelation 8, there's silence for half an hour. That's the seventh seal. And out of that seventh seal come seven trumpets of judgment. Okay, so you, you have seven seals. There's a half an hour pause before the seventh seal. And then the seventh seal, it has seven trumpets. And this takes us uh, to, I believe, the second half of the tribulation period. Nope, 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 nope. We're still in the first half. The bulls are the second half. So trumpet number one, and i got to go fast because of the sake of time. 
One third of all vegetation on the earth is struck with hail, fire, and blood. Trumpet number two, one third of all seas turn to blood. One third of all living creatures die. One third of all ships perish. Number three, of the great star called Wormwood falls and turns one third of the waters bitter and poisonous. Number four, the sun, moon, and stars will be struck. One third will fall, light not given for one third of the day or night, a warning of woe for the upcoming trumpets. Trumpet number five, locusts from the bottomless pit can only torment unbelievers, cannot kill them, only torture them as a scorpion sting, will last five months, men will want to die but cannot. Trumpet number six, four angels released to kill one third of mankind through fire, smoke, and brimstone, and yet they will not repent. Now in between trumpet six and seven, God is going to raise up two witnesses. Now we're to Revelation chapter 11. God is going to raise up two witnesses. Most of us believe, and I believe this, those two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah. They're the two men that never died a natural death here on the earth. And they're going to be given all sorts of power. They're going to preach for almost three and a half years. They cannot be killed. Anyone who comes against them, they burn with fire. But eventually, the Lord will allow them to be overcome by the beast that comes out of the pit here later down in the book of Revelation. But they will rise from the dead in three and a half days, ascend to heaven, and an earthquake will happen and kill 7,000 people in Jerusalem. So there's going to be two witnesses, Enoch and Elijah. And when we study this out in the book of Revelation, we see they're basically preaching to TV cameras, and the whole world is watching. And the whole world hates them. And they're preaching righteousness. They're preaching Jesus. You know, I got to ask you, what type of preaching does the world hate today? You know, there's a lot of preaching the world will tolerate. If we preach, love your neighbor, they love it. If we preach, feed the poor, they love it. What type of preaching does the world hate? Repent. Yeah. If, if, if we say you're a sinner, you need a Savior. If we say certain things are sin, the world hates that. Okay? And, and when, so when Enoch and Elijah come to preach, they're going to preach the same thing that John the Baptist preached. They're going to preach the same thing that Jesus preached. They're going to preach what Elijah preached back in the day. They're going to preach what Elisha preached. They're going to preach what the prophets preached. They're going to preach, repent from your sin and live for Jesus. Live in righteousness. And the world will hate them for it. That brings us to trumpet number six. The angelic proclamation of the lordship of Jesus Christ all over the earth. Jesus is going to do what has rarely been done. Uh, he's going to send an angel to preach the gospel in an effort to make sure that everybody has a chance. Okay. And that brings us to Revelation 12 and 13. I think I can get, get you... I'll take the next three minutes and get you as fast as I can. Okay. In Revelation 12 and 13, we see the introduction of the dragon who is Satan, the beast from the sea who got its authority from the dragon, and the beast from the earth, and that's where they will promote the mark of the beast or what we hear is the 666. The significance of 666, I've heard many people guess. I think it's very simple. The number three is the number of completion. The number six is the number of man. I think that the belief of 666 is the belief that man is complete in himself. Three sixes. Man is complete in himself. He does not need God. I think that's one of the, one of the greatest sins of, of, of homosexuality. 
is we say, I, I am not created in the image of God. I am not created according to God's likeness. That's, what, that's, that's the belief behind that. They're rejecting the creation. They're saying they're complete in themselves. They don't need God. Okay. Uh, Revelation 14.14, 14. let's turn there. I want you to see this. So you've got all this bad stuff happening. The system is failing. Ca cosmic chaos, violence, shortages, inflation... But you've got 144,000 Jewish preachers, you've got the two witnesses, you've had an angel preaching, and then go to verse 14 of chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud said, sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. What's that sound like? To me, that's a, that's a mid-tribulation rapture. Now, you don't have to believe this, but I think I see great evidence for a pre-tribulation rapture. And if we're around, that's us. But then... In God's mercy, because what's about to happen next is the second half of the tribulation. It's about to get even worse. And God, in his mercy, is going to take those that have gotten born again out of the earth so they don't have to suffer like what is about to happen. So thrust in the sickle and reap. And so there's a reaping of the harvest. Isn't that cool? Revelation 14. Now, can I make a doctrine about that? No. Why? We don't have any other supporting scripture. And we have to have two or three witnesses before we can establish anything as a doctrine. So even though I believe that's very strongly possible, I don't believe I have enough evidence to say this is an actual doctrine. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I think it's very strongly possible. And if you miss the first bus, you definitely want to take the second bus. Okay. Uh, then verse 17 tells us that the grapes of wrath are about to really be poured out. And then let me just give you, there's going to be seven bold judgments. Let me give them to you in order. This is over three and a half years. Number one, loathsome sores on everybody who has the mark of the beast. Number two, all the seas become blood, all the sea creatures die. Number three, all fresh waters turn to blood. Number four, men are scorched with great fire. Number five, darkness and great pain. Number six, the Euphrates River dries up and prepares for Armageddon, and many wicked spirits gather there. And number seven, great, earth, great earthquake as never before, huge hailstones, many cities fall. In Revelation 17, we see the introduction of the great whore, that would be the false church, and cahoots with the beast. In Revelation 18, Babylon will fall, that's the world system. And in Revelation 19 is the battle of Armageddon where the devil and his cohorts think they're going to take on Jesus. It doesn't last long. Amen. That is the book of Revelation in 40 minutes, the tribulation period. Amen. But you and I have hope. And I'll tell you again, if we have to go through it, we'll go through it. All right? I, just, I don't know about you, but once we get to the revelation period, just, just walk up to them and say, Here, I believe in Jesus. I'm not taking the mark. Go ahead and cut it off. Just get it over with. Amen. Yeah, do it quick. <laughs> well, I plan on being out of here. Well, I'm not so sure about you. Uh, you want to hear it? Now, you want me to tell you something cool? I'll tell you something cool before we go eat pizza. Now, this, this, is, this is what I think, all right? So, so this is what I think. I have friends who don't think this way, 
but I, I believe uh, that uh, there's a place right now called, uh, there was a place called Abraham's bosom, called paradise. And Jesus, when he says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. I believe paradise is what's called Abraham's bosom, which is where Lazarus and the rich man was spoken of in that account in the Bible. And I believe that Old Testament Jews who were righteous went to paradise or Abraham's bosom, not to heaven when they died. Why? How's the only way you can get to heaven? Through Jesus Christ. So I believe they went to paradise, to, bo to, to Abraham's bosom. And that was a holding area for Old Testament Jews. And I believe people sometimes ask, where did Jesus go on, on, when he, on those three days? I, I, I humbly believe Jesus went to paradise because he said, today you'll be with me in paradise and I believe he preached to those Old Testament saints so that they could receive the blood of Jesus and go to heaven. That's what I believe. Now, there's people that believe other than that, and we love them too. Amen. And uh, it's not a prerequisite to be saved, to have that right, but that's just what I believe. And I think that's so cool. And I, I, just, I see the love of Jesus all through the Bible. I see how much he loves us. You know, I, I was preaching on, on, on TV today, and I just couldn't get over the fact. You know, they came to Jesus with all sorts of problems. And Jesus said, I'm going to help you. And even one time he was busy, he said, I don't have time to help you. She said, pretty, pretty, please. He said, okay, I'll help you. The only time he didn't help them was when they wouldn't let it. They said he couldn't because of their unbelief. But man, he, he, he loves us. When I see this revelation, I see love. I see God saying, please don't go to hell. Please don't suffer for all of eternity. That's what I hear him saying. Well, let's bless the pizza. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless the pizza. Lord, help us to not eat too much, especially after 8 o'clock as we get older. And we thank you for a good time of fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen.